Hi, guys. Welcome to the How to Raise It podcast, the show where you get an inside, unfiltered look at how real entrepreneurs and VCs raise capital for their businesses. I'm your host, Nathan Beckert, and today's episode is with Amir Farha of Kotu Ventures based in Dubai. Kotu invests in seed and pre-seed startups based in the MENA region with a focus on startups based in the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. In this episode, we go deep into the developing startup scene in the Middle East, tips for raising capital from sovereign wealth funds, tactics for securing a lead LP, and much, much more. If you're tuning into this podcast to learn how to raise capital for your business, be sure to check out foundersuite.com if you're a startup or fundingstack.com if you are a VC or advisor to get an awesome collection of tools for raising capital. Both platforms include a massive investor database, a CRM to manage your raise, a virtual data room to run due diligence, plus pitch deck hosting, investor updates, email tools, and much more. Last but not least, if you enjoy this conversation and think someone else would too, please share it with them and hit that subscribe button to get all our latest episodes. Thank you. Now sit back and enjoy this chat with Amir. Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Founder Suite and FundingStack.com. That I have Amir Farha of Kotu Ventures coming to us from Dubai. How's your day going? Great. I was saying earlier, I just became an uncle to a beautiful niece called Mila. So exciting day for me. Mila, great name. Congratulations. Yeah. Very exciting. Thank you. Is that there in Dubai or, or somewhere? Yeah, nearby? she's in Dubai. Exactly. Excellent. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Let's jump right into it. What is Kotu Ventures? Kotu is a as a early stage. We do pre-seed and seed investing across the Middle East. Um, uh, we, we what I what I like to call it. We do idea to post product. We invest in teams all the way to just basic MVPs, and um, we are high conviction investors where we concentrate capital into. Uh, portfolio of companies across the wider region, backing founders first. Um, and uh, yeah, we've been doing this for about three years now. We raised our first fund, which I can talk about today. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, we're trying to pioneer sort of early stage investing in the region. We will definitely spend a lot of time on raising the fund, but let's talk a little bit more about what you're investing in out of this fund. So pre-seed and seed. And then I think I saw maybe a little bit of a, a bias towards fintech and B2B or what's your is there an industry focus? Yeah. So what we do is we we kind of tend to be people first investors and we focus, we're a reflection of what the deal flow of the ecosystem kind of uh, uh, produces. And today it's mostly fintech and B2B software. Um, that tends to be the majority of companies in the in the portfolio today. How about geographic location? Mina, Mina covers quite a bit of territory. Where are you seeing the most deals? Are you focused on any you know particular markets? Yeah, so today, uh, majority of our companies are UAE-founded companies. Most of the companies we invest in target the whole MENA region, uh, essentially. Um, and what uh, our distribution today is UAE, Saudi, and Egypt majority uh, of our portfolio with uh, heavily uh, sort of biased towards UAE because it's the most developed uh, market today. Saudi is the fastest growing. And so we have also have a, a, about four of our 21 companies uh, out of Saudi as well. Um, I think you know we're we're optimistic in that we cover most of the of these uh, sort of regions, but we we uh, are doubling down on on uh, on the UAE and Saudi in particular. So UAE most developed ecosystem, Saudi growing fastest. How about Egypt? And I have to have to warn you, I have a decently large team in Egypt. So what's Egypt kind of notable for? Uh, yeah, so Egypt. I mean, great talent. It's the most dense in terms of engineering and product talent. Um, I mean, we've had successes in Egypt over the past decade and the ecosystem there. Um, it's had its challenges economically. And what we look for in Egypt specifically are businesses that are being built and benefit from the cost advantage of Egypt and the highly uh, skilled uh, labor force there or sort of engineers. And they're producing for markets like uh, GCC, so the Gulf region, as well as emerging markets and oftentimes global Um there are many. There, there are a handful of success stories that have mi managed to migrate out of Egypt to these markets already, uh, and we like that thesis because of the sort of uh, arbitrage you have, where you get revenue from, you know, stronger economies, and you have the cost center uh, of Egypt. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Yes, I won't tell you what we we pay our 
wonderful Egypt people, but they are a great value. <laughs> I'll yeah, say that. yeah. Um, Hardest working people, to be honest, in the region. You have, I have to say that. Like they 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 live to work there, and it's a it's a testament to like the the culture of of the people there. So, yeah, yeah, good. Do most Egyptian startups end up? What you know, if they're successful, do they move over to UAE? I mean, is is it kind of yeah UAE like a hub or magnet? For startups that's a great question so what typically happens is um you know most of these companies start off in their home markets even saudi as well um and then as they uh, mature and get through sort of um, let's say product market fit and scaling they tend to have to uh, source talent uh, from you know globally in order to beef up or strengthen their their leadership team and their senior team and because most of them saudi and egypt in particular are very local markets local uh, talent uh, sits in those in both those places while the uae has positioned itself as a global city uh, or a country uh, specifically dubai as a city that benefits from international talent coming. So what typically happens at, let's say, north of Series A and B is these companies end up setting up a, a sort of headquarters in the UAE and attract, you know, senior leadership teams uh, from everywhere. Um, and, and and you see that happening more often as these companies mature today because we're still at an early ecosystem stage and these types of um, uh, trends are only manifesting over the past five years in the region. Interesting. And what types of startups are coming from these different regions? Is it, you know, kind of clones of Western or U.S. Yeah. startups at, that they're relocalizing for the local market? Or is it more true, you know, novelty, uh, innovative things or both? Yeah, look, I, I think I think just as is with most emerging ecosystems, they tend to be sort of copycat and then localized copycat models. Um, and I think for the most part, most part, that's been the case for the past, let's say, uh, decade uh, or so in the region. You know, everything from the essentials like horizontal classifieds, uh, you know, property classifieds, job sites. Uh, you have ride hailing now, obviously, and food delivery and all these like staple uh, uh, businesses. Those have all emerged over the past decade. And to today, what's happening is you're finding um, a lot more people trying to solve local problems, especially on the software side uh, that businesses are facing specifically. Uh, and the exciting thing about the region is, is that ultimately there's so many white spaces. So if you tackle, you know, relative to let's say, you know, very um, mature ecosystems like the US where you have to really be narrow and solve a very narrow problem. In, in the region, typically you'll find, you'll start off solving one particular problem, let's say in payroll, but that then lends itself well to other uh, modules within, uh, let's say, expense management or even HR, right? Because technology has yet to fully penetrate a lot of these enterprises and, and businesses. And so what we what gets us excited is, you know, these companies tend to t make up their own journey post the localized copycat model. They start innovating on top of that. Um, and I think there's some examples like Tabby, for example, which is a buy now, pay later equivalent in the region. I think it's, you know, Possibly the highest, from a, the the most efficient from a unit economics perspective of any BNPL player globally, because of the under uh, credit penetration in the in the region today, and their end goal is not to be a BNPL player. They're gonna you know hopefully add more financial services across uh, the suite of products they have, which is not typical of a Klarna and other type of uh, equivalents that are in more developed markets. So that's kind of how we think about it. Um, sorry, I kind of maybe went on a tangent. Yeah, no, that's asking, but yeah, definitely interesting. Any, kind of a loaded question or a trick question, because the answer is going to be yes. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. But is the MENA region by itself big enough to like generate startups that will generate, you know, venture scale returns? Or do your investments kind of need to go more broadly global? Yeah, so our our, our belief is yes in certain categories. Um, you know, financial services or fintech is one, uh, real estate, uh, insurance, uh, healthcare. They are they are massive industries that alone you could potentially build like anything north of a half a billion to potentially unicorn type scale. Um, but ultimately, Saudi Arabia is really where the biggest market opportunity sits today. And so a lot of the companies we invest in generally have to have an angle to enter that market and capture, you know, your market share there if they were if they are to really generate outsized returns. Um, there have been examples of, you know, let's say in the UAE where real estate is probably the most advanced and most mature uh, sector in, in the economy outside of obviously tourism. And uh, and that and, and businesses that have tapped into that sector have been able to generate serious scale. 
uh, and you know on track to generate venture type returns in my past life i invested in a company called property finder which is a big property classified site that today is backed by general atlantic most of its revenue comes from the uae and they're like a billion dollar company today so and they do you know property classifieds which uh you know is a sector that's you know growing really fast in the uae um so yes in short uh but you know um it, it's it's you know for us at least at the stage we invest in having outcomes that are not necessarily unicorns could still give us venture like like returns and we believe that today uh generally companies can be far more capital efficient because of the lack of competition and and the kind of the cost efficient ways to acqu- acquire customers relative to other you know uh, more developed ecosystems where you have to pay a lot of money to do that so there are advantages uh, but you know yet to be seen at you know it's it, these things take a bit of time to show up uh, if that makes sense how how big is the population of Saudi Arabia do you know off the top of your head uh, well, close to 40 million okay so, gotcha yeah, yeah. 30 30 or 33 or so if i remember correctly Maybe more now. With yeah. Little side story. I, my my dad was a doctor and he moved us to Saudi Arabia, to Dahran, uh, when I was a kid and from the mountains of Colorado. So we grew up in this tiny town in wow. Colorado. And he says, hey, guys, at dinner dinner one night, guys, we're moving to Saudi Arabia. And we didn't even know where that was, right? <laughs> but it was That's a funny. really interesting year. I mean, I, that was just my exposure into that world. It's like such a different that world. From so interesting. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Look, I mean, I mean, honestly, it is a market that's that's built. So it's such a local market that it's very hard to penetrate outside in. You have to really find. It's a it's a very nuanced place. The 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 Saudi is going to win that market. It's not like you're going to get like a. I don't know, like a revolut that's going to go into Saudi and win that market. It has to be local because they just the nuances are so different, even how the consumers behave, let alone the businesses operate. So there's so many, uh, you know, massive uh, differences that you kind of have to rebuild your product to cater to that audience. And so knowing the local market inside out really helps. And so that's the only way to really win that market through potentially acquiring or finding an amazing team and empowering them. Are these markets, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Similar enough that kind of to your point, an Egyptian startup could understand and own the Saudi Arabian market or each, is each one like so nuanced yeah. from each other that you kind of have to be homegrown. I don't know if that makes sense. That's absolutely it. No, no, it makes exact sense. So every market is different. So you technically have to rebuild your product. Not Some some are, uh, let's say, seamless transitions like buy now, pay later is kind of Relatively the same in UAE and 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 and, uh, and Saudi, so the transition isn't that challenging. Uh, although consumer behavior is different and credit penetration is different locally, um, you know, ride hailing the same. There are some nuances from a marketing perspective and from a customer service perspective that are probably uh, you know you need to pay attention to, or even how the drivers operate in those markets. Uh, but you know, for the most part, um, depending on the business model. Some can naturally transition, but majority, I would say, have to be re- kind of radically rebuilt. Not not end to end, but a significant portion of the product has to re- be rebuilt for that for that uh, audience and that uh, that customer base. Interesting. All right, uh, let's move on here. Give us a quick story, like how'd you get into venture? I mean, I, then we're going to get to raising the fund, but maybe yeah, a little backstory before uh, launching Co2. Yeah. Yeah, I, I so, so I, I studied computer science. So I grew up. I mean, I graduated and went to university in two thousand pre uh, dot com sort of bust. And I did computer science, worked as a software engineer, uh, and like consider myself like a problem solver. I worked. Uh, I worked uh, for about a year and a half before I realized I don't want to be a programmer. And I got into uh, do a masters that landed me a job at a publicly listed real estate company in the UK that was founded by this phenomenal Swedish entrepreneur. And he took aside capital from his balance sheet and he said, I want to invest in innovation in Stockholm and uh, the UK. And so he built a small team that managed that pool of capital, investing across all stages. And that's kind of where I interned uh, right after my master's. And I got to know what venture capital was about. This is in 2005. Social networking was a theme of the time there. Facebook didn't exist. At the time, we had invested in the biggest social network in Sweden. You know, it's dead now. It's It's totally been decimated by Facebook back back then, but but it was a learning curve, right? And so I learned the trade. I, I loved uh, interacting with young, uh, you know, innovators who are trying to change the world. Uh, moved back to Dubai thinking I wanted to do the same thing, but Dubai and the Middle East was so backwards back then. It was like nobody really spent any money on digital 
there were no digital products. I mean, we didn't even have a classifieds business back then in 2008. I mean, there was one that just launched at that time. Um, so I launched what was the first seed fund uh, backed by the Dubai government to invest and catalyze the whole ecosystem. It was a seed fund with an angel network that we kind of pushed uh, across the region, majority in the UAE. Um, and then, you know, we invested in a bunch of companies that didn't really, uh, we were really, I would say, pre-Ground uh, ground Zero, like we were really early. But, you know, we uh, we uh, sort of tried to create and catalyze that movement. And then I ended up starting an advisory firm to help governments think about entrepreneurship. And through that, I interacted with uh, with a company called Bait.com. They were the job site of the region, the leading job site, which was co-founded by a cousin of mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got together and we said, hey, uh, we could use Bait's infrastructure. They have offices across the Middle East. They were profitable. And we could invest in technology companies. And it was way too early. So that project got paused. But we got together three years later and we started the fund called Beko Capital, which uh, was probably the second uh, VC in, uh, act in the region. We started investing deal by deal investing over two years from 2012 to 2014. And we launched our first fund in 2014. We launched another fund in 2018. And then I left in 2020. And in 2021, I launched Co2. Um, and I, I give anecdotally some, some indicators. Like when we started in 2012, there was about $20 million in the in the whole of MENA Venture. All of MENA, outside of Israel, of course, was $20 million to, in total. Last year, I think we crossed over $2 billion, $2.5 billion in the whole MENA region. So, you know, you see the compounding happening really fast. And, and with it, you know, there comes pockets of gaps in the ecosystem. And I think for me, what I saw is over time is I love being the first Czech investor because I feel like that's where you build really deep connections with founders. Uh, it's a very chaotic space. So you need to have patience and kind of, uh, really be create a safe space for founders to figure things out. And so I, I doubled down on Co2 with that strategy. And I felt that there was a gap in the ecosystem to really own being um, a, a pre-seed and seed investor. So uh, my predecessor, Beko, have gone on to raise uh, other funds and they've you know gone to be primarily a Series A investor in the ecosystem. And so, which is exciting for the ecosystem as you're getting more pockets of, of venture uh, investors that are trying to you know, give founders more optionality in what they have uh, in front of them. Um, yeah, anyway. really cool. Yeah, good story. Yeah. Um, so, when did you launch? When did you sort of formally launch Co2? Yeah, Co2. I guess it was like uh, when I left in twenty. I left uh, back on twenty July twenty twenty, and I didn't know if I want to do another fund. Uh, but you know, months later, I uh, was approached by several founders who, you know, kind of enticed me to invest in them and. One of them happened to be a, 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 an ex-analyst of mine at Beko who went to start a company called Huspy. Huspy is now um, it's one of the fastest growing startups in the region, backed by Sequoia India. And more recently, they got a, an investment from Bolton Capital in the, in, in the UK. And they're you know doing really exciting things around real estate, as I mentioned before. But I, I invested in, in three or four companies, and then I used that and the momentum of Huspy to say, you know what, maybe it's time I, I actually think about uh, institutionalizing this through a fund structure. And, May 2021, I went to start raising, and then I did my first close in October, and then I did my final close a year or so after that. So uh, it's been, uh, yeah, so that was, so it's kind of, you know, we were investing, building a team, and and raising money all at the same time, which is, I have to say, like, probably the hardest thing uh, I, I've ever done. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's different, but similar to how startup founders have to both keep the business running and fundraise, both of which are more than a full-time job all at the same time, right? Yeah, <laughs> You've got to yeah, exactly. be finding startups, investing, and finding investors for your fund all at the same time kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, it's yeah. impossible, but that's the that's it's where the seemingly impossible right? when you look back. But when, when you're there, you're like, you're doing it. You're getting it through it. You're getting yeah. through it. Uh, anyway, so I, yeah. I think it's a $50 million fund. Is that correct? Yeah, it's just under 54 million, 53.6 million. Oh, yeah. So let's talk about raising this. So uh, May 21, you launched this first close in October, but let's kind of fill in the yeah. little bit more detail That's around cool. this. Yeah. Great. So as I mentioned, in October, September, I, I got approached by Jad Antoun, the founder of Huspi, and he was like, wanted me to back him. And obviously, I, I, I really believed in him. So through a series of investments, uh, I first went to people that trust me blindly and know my experience in venture in my past life. And they were like, and I got them to sort of pledge uh, a pool of capital, $100,000, just to say, look, if I invest, invest with me and let's put a syndicate together, which in the event I do raise a fund, I can warehouse that into the fund structure. So I, these are people that, 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 that wanted to back me. And so through that, I got about 10 of my friends 
um, with me. And uh, we did deal by deal investing, kind of similar to how I started Beko. Um, and luckily enough, we we kind of picked a couple of exciting companies. Um, and then what triggered it for me was ultimately uh, I was being approached to, to lead uh, a sovereign uh, venture um, entity. And through that process, I, I realized actually I, I, I need to run my own fund. Being part of that uh, bureaucracy is very difficult uh, once you're used to being free as an investor. Uh, you, you know, So that convinced me that I need to go down my own path. And so I had an anchor investor or a, a large sovereign fund that, that knew me in my past life that just believed in me. And so they kind of supported me with a commitment, uh, obviously with a certain um, sweetener on the deal, you know, just discounted sort of fees structure. And that allowed me to go to market with, uh, you know, uh, some uh, confidence. And so through that, I, I started approaching, um, I, I think I had about 300 or so calls with investors that ended up ha coming down to about 70, including the 10 that supported me early on. So 60 new investors showed up over a year and a half of fundraising. Uh, at first close, I got to about 24 million, uh, which was half the close to half the fund. And then we did about five closes after that to get to the, the rest. And, and um, you know, I was told early on to do, whenever you have commitments, just keep closing. Uh, so you keep building momentum. And that really worked out for me. Um, also hiring. I had a great uh, guy early on called Gavin Walsh, who took over all the onboarding and, and and administrative side. We don't have angel list, doesn't really work for our structure, which is a Cayman fund. So we had to do a lot of heavy lifting on the LP onboarding and, and documentation management, which he really did a great job at doing that allowed me to focus on fundraising and investing. So things sort of came into place because it's kind of opportunistic. It wasn't like I was looking for Gavin. He showed up in a moment that, that mattered. And so I believe in these things that they kind of come together if you give it all the energy and attention it needs. And so it was... Uh, I can, we can go through all of them. I can, yeah, I can no, also... it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Let me poke in on a couple of questions. So, you know, sort of going back to the starting days, did you actually form a formal syndicate uh, before actually, you know, raising the fund or did you, was it more informal? Like informal. It was, yeah. uh, hey guys, will you, uh, will you put up a hundred K in pledge a hundred K to any deal that I do? And uh, universally, well, tw 10 out of the 12 people I talked to said yes. And then what what would happen is I would commit with the founder, then I then I pull the capital together from my friends and then distribute that to the founder very informally. Was it uh, was it you were asking your friends, ten friends, pledge hundred k for this particular deal, or was it more pledge hundred k? I'm going to find some deals, you know, yeah. almost a quasi venture fund. Yes, exactly. Pledge hundred k. I'm going to I'm getting deals. It was catalyzed by one deal, so it was like I have this deal, commit to this and. Add a, a, a bit of more money, so you give me 100k, and I'll do this deal plus a few others. And if I do warehouse in the fund, then you come in at special terms. And if I don't, then this will be the pool of companies, and and we would just, uh, you know, hopefully do well with those yeah four or so investments. And then you know you kind of talked about getting to that that first anchor. So can you name who the anchor was, and how did you actually yeah. land them? Yeah. So the so the person in charge at the time of this uh, the, the entity was called Chimera. Uh, they're part of a, um, a big Abu Dhabi uh, sort of uh, royal family. Not to name exact names here, but but in general, uh, the person who who took on the role of deploying capital for them was an was an investor in my prior life. He he, he saw me, and we had a really deep relationship in the in in my sort of nine years at building Beko. So he saw he saw me firsthand and and, and was uh, very supportive when I decided to go out to market. Uh, the conversations happened in twofold. Like when I left, I told him, I'm thinking about starting a fund. Would you be interested? He said, yes. I wasn't ready to. So then I said, I got the syndicate together. And then when I saw that, 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 that I'm, I actually am fully convinced that this is where I want to go. I had conviction around the strategy. I went back to him with a, with a proper proposal and he, he was, a, he was quite, uh, you know, keen and, and and very direct with the with his sort of commitment, and then through that, I started speaking to other other uh, investors. Um, if you can share, yeah. like, because I think getting that first anchor is so key, right? And both for startups and for venture funds, right? So if you can share, you know, you're raising this fifty million dollar fund. Can you share how much that anchor commitment was for? Like, what did you ask for, and did you give them special terms to come in as the first? That's always the bravest bravest person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, he's the bravest person. Yes, that's for sure. I, I love. It's kind of like the approach we have with founders. We want to be the first one. So he was that for me for sure. Um, he championed me 
Look, I think uh, it, it, we didn't have. I didn't. It, it, when I went to him, it was it was not necessarily for an amount, but to anchor, and and he anchored it with uh, uh, just you know over fifteen percent of the of the uh, total fund size. But it was a sort of ten percent with up front, and then as I got to the fifty, it would sort of scale upwards uh, to to just over fifteen percent. Um, and he had a discount on on sort of the the carried interest uh, that was enough uh, to. But but but, I think ultimately um, it wasn't really what was the swaying factor. It was just like you wanted to be a win win at the end of the day, and I think uh, it was. Yeah, and you have an excellent blog post which we'll link in the in the in the thread here or in the body of the description. But you talk about building a pipeline. You talk about five hundred emails, three hundred pitches, seventy you know entities coming in. How did you kind of source? How did you build this pipeline? And was it only MENA investors? What types of investors were you going after? And how did you get in touch with them? Big question. Honestly, <laughs> great question. No, no, look, I, I, I think obviously my, it's a bit different in the case that I've been doing this for a while. So I had some existing relationships that I could, could tap into. And so that was the first port of call. Like uh, there are some sovereign entities that existed that were deploying into funds. So I knew them as well in a, a, ahead of time. So let's say there were about 150 that were relationships that I could existing tap into. The other 350 came from GPs. So I had a, a couple of GPs that invested in my fund that were not from the region. Uh, um, well, one was, but majority were not from the region. And they sort of introduced me to other uh, GPs and LPs. Uh, that was quite helpful. Founders. These are other my funds? Fund. Sorry to cut you off. Is, are these other um, regional individuals? Funds? Well, they're individuals, uh, not regional funds. They were international funds. So uh, you know, um, I, I'm I'm part of the Kaufman uh, Fellowship, so a lot of my network is kind of spans not just regional but outside. And you know, over time and being in the industry for so long, I built a lot of trust with certain GPs that that supported me. Someone like, for example, Brad Feld is a, is, is a great supporter, and he came into the fund. Um, Fred Destin as well, who's a famous uh, and and pro profound uh, pro phenomenal VC out of uh, the UK called Stride. Um, so, you know, they uh, were very supportive. Um, my my existing LPs introduced me to other LPs. That was quite useful, especially when they committed. Um, I had founders of mine, even though I was like early founders that backed me as LPs, but also introduced me to other people. So I, I, I was not, I, I would take calls with anyone who was interested in hearing about uh, like what I was doing. And, you know, I've been doing this long enough to know that this it's not really a pitch. It's just like, this is what I'm doing. And, and most people uh, either want to be part of it or find me in a venture quite an exotic uh, space that they wouldn't be interested in. So it's quite binary in that situation. Um, well, like for, but yeah. for someone like Brad Feld, who's obviously got investments in tons of startups and also other venture funds, was it more, I'm sure he liked you, but do you think it was more, hey, I, I really like this guy or, hey, I want to get some exposure to the MENA, almost, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, Brad's been a mentor. Yeah. Great question. So he visited Dubai over 10 years ago and we met him over lunch. And since that day, I've sought counsel, sought his counsel in, in, in many things that I've been doing in life. From when I left my old firm, he was one of the first people I reached out to to get his counsel. So we knew each other well. Uh, and I, you know, when I told him I was setting up a fund and I asked him if he was interested, he was, he looked at the deck and was you know, he didn't say I want to look at venture Mina. He was he he knows me, so it was uh, it was. I don't want to say it's because of me, but I, I believe it was primarily because of our relationship and and his belief in what I was doing. So yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, you know, let's talk about some of the other LP sources. Maybe here's a very specific question: What tips can you give for finding, approaching, and pitching sovereign entities? And maybe even define what a sovereign entity. We're talking about a sovereign wealth fund, right? Maybe what yeah. is that? And then how do you find and pitch these folks? <laughs> yeah. So the sovereign entities are like reserves by owned by like basically the governments um, that are used to generate returns uh, and sometimes catalyze uh, certain industries. Uh, in this case, uh, it was entities like Dubai Dis Future District Fund, which was a new Dubai uh, uh, founded sort of sovereign fund that was a fund of funds to, and a direct investor in the ecosystem. Mubadala is a famous one, of course. They do everything from growth, private equity to now venture and fund of fund investing for the region. 
Uh, and then you have like uh, Saudi sovereign funds uh, that are focused mainly on Saudi activations. Uh, for our first fund, majority of our sovereign money came from the UAE. Uh, there is another one called Chimera, which actually has now restructured into an entity called Donate. They are uh, sort of quasi-sovereign royal families within that same uh, sort of bracket. And, um, and uh, how I think for me primarily is um, through trusted relationships. So, you know, these type of things take a long time to foster. You need to uh, kind of engage with every stakeholder multiple times over a long period um, and kind of show progress in whatever you're doing and show momentum and show uh, sort of insight and learning so that, you know, uh, you build trust and you build uh, credibility and it takes years. But once um, that happens, sort of, their their job is to deploy capital. So if they find what you're doing exciting and different to what they see, it it now you know you have a very high chance of hopefully uh, leading to a, a commitment. Um, that doesn't mean that they'll commit to every fund. After that, you still have to you know uh, continue pitching them on the next fund. And sometimes teams change in these government entities because of um, let's say you know new strategies and so forth. Which is a challenge. Uh, it's not like a sort of patient capital that you have in endowments and in in, in the U.S. It's it's a bit more transitory. So uh, you have to continue building those relationships. You don't stop once you have them. That's that's ultimately the other message that that one would have to think about. Um, and you have to approach it from every angle possible. So any stakeholder, whether it's an analyst all the way through to a decision maker, just keep engaged um, and invite them to. Uh, let's say for us, it was our annual LP meeting. You know, they would come and see what we're doing. Uh, we'd introduce them to found to our some of our founders. They'd get an idea of the quality of companies we invest in. So, these type of things take take. Um, I think show a lot uh, to to. Interesting. To build, so, uh, sovereign yeah. wealth funds, sovereign entities are always pretty much a multi-year sales process. Is that a true statement? Do you think multi-year continuous sales? Uh -huh. process. Even once you get them as a sale, you have to continue. Uh, uh, ma managing and and uh, nurturing that that relationship it's not uh but i guess uh, the payoff is if you land them their funds are huge right i mean isn't saudis i just read some of the headlines they have gigantic funds correct yeah but i think um uh, you know with all honesty and sort of being candid i think a very small amount is dedicated for the middle east they mm -hmm. want to diversify and so they that that pool of capital that you that you imagine the size of it, it's it really is dedicated to non mina investing. Uh, what's available to mina is is really a fraction of it, and it's a reflection of where we are as an ecosystem. So as we continue growing, hopefully that pocket of capital grows with it. But right now it's it's still a fraction. Uh, you know, it's not uh, it's not as big as one would would imagine for the for the mina managers that exist. That makes sense. And the last question on sovereign entities, but do you have to weave into your pitch an element of like, hey, we're going to create a lot of jobs in Saudi Arabia? Or I mean, is there sort of that economic development piece? Or are they just looking yeah. for returns? So it depends on who you're talking to. Every sovereign has its own strategy. Um, they all are um, universally wanting their local cities. So Abu Mubadala wants Abu Dhabi to, to be sort of um, put on the map and, and, and developed. Dubai Future District, District Fund wants Dubai to, 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 to obviously shine. And then Saudi is obviously the wider Saudi region. Uh, some have conditions. So some of the Saudi sovereigns say, if you if we give you X, you have to put X into Saudi companies or, or Saudi, let's say, led growth opportunities. Um, but it, it really depends. So yes and no. Yeah. All good. Okay, we've talked about the sovereign. We've talked about the GPs from other venture funds like Brad Feld. How about... Um, I see uh, several family offices. This is in the tech crunch I'm looking at. Uh, share whatever you can about, you know, courting and closing family offices when raising your first fund. Yeah, look, I think for me, um, two things are happening in the family office, uh, let's say, ecosystem. I would say for the past decade, they've, the, the most sophisticated have been exposed to uh, Mina Venture, you know, the, the let's say the whole Mina VC system has been alive for about 12 years, maybe a bit more. But in that period, they've been pitched. And so the level of sophistication and understanding of what's happening in the region is growing. Um, and that means that when we have conversations today with, with family offices in, in, in the region, they're able to be uh, far more knowledgeable and 
you know, engaged when it comes to what's happening in the Middle East, especially with the shift in Saudi's policy and Saudi social reforms. Today, the Saudi family office is much more attuned to investing in their local economies because they see the growth potential that's ahead of it, um, which didn't exist, I'd say, pre the reforms as much. Um, so these type of trends are making it far uh, more, uh, let's say, enticing for family offices to get engaged. So when you have a conversation with them, they're far more open to the idea and uh, you have a lot more funds. So the, the fact that we have more VCs pitching you know, more families, they're also more, uh, let's say, uh, exposed to the asset class. And so, you know, for me, it was like two types of families, one that would be that would reach, reach me because they were saying, I want to look at Mina Venture. And so people would know me from my experience and track record and say, hey, you should speak to Amir. And then I would engage and learn about their strategy and see if there's a fit. Then there were some that knew me, uh, the managers of the family offices knew me in my past life. Those were like sort of the low hanging fruit. Um, what wasn't easy to get them either, but they were just people that already knew me. So the trust was built. Um, and then through them, you would meet other families. So there is that sort of referral network because they do invest together, especially in Saudi. I think there's a lot more of that kind of uh, collaborative uh, experience there. Um, yeah. So, you know, thankfully, uh, I have some great families who've supported me and, and and hopefully continue to do that as I as I go out to raise more funds and new families that I've met because of them that I think will eventually, when they want to get exposure to this asset class, hopefully. hopefully You're the go-to uh, guy. You're the go-to yeah, guy hopefully. for exposure to early stage Mina, right? <laughs> no, I hope so. And, and, yeah, yeah, that's uh, hopefully, yeah. Well, let's talk about that because one of your uh, excellent posts or points is, um, you know, really defining your offering. I mean, I guess, is that kind of your, you know, your brand like, hey, you want exposure to this region at the earliest stages? this is my, my billboard, right? Is that kind of, yeah. Or what, what yeah, was, so, yeah, go ahead, please. So I think I leaned into my track record as the, as the anchor to the first fund. It wasn't like I had a big team in place. You know, it was like, this is what I built. This is my network and we're getting traction. Um, I, when I, when I mentioned the defining offering, it's like, at first, you know, I tell people like we well, said, let's be useful to founders today. Founders don't have a place to have difficult conversations, I've seen it in the past where investors don't uh, uh, are, are not forgiving to founders, and they're quite transactional in their approach. And so the relationship with the founder and the VC is quite uh, tense. And so one of the approaches we have is like, how do we position ourselves differently? Because we are different. We don't see ourselves as a VC. We see ourselves essentially as an extension to the founding team. Like they need added resources when it comes to helping them hire good people. We're there to help them. They need extra resource when it comes to fundraising. Uh, we're there to help them. They need extra resource when it comes to go to market, we're there to help them. And, and that's sort of an offering that has honed in over time. So at the beginning, I wrote a manifesto when I first started saying, we're here to be useful to founders. We want to be useful. Useful can be so broad. And then over time, as we started working with them, we realized there are three things we want to be really good at. And so those three things were, as I mentioned, hiring uh, or helping them hire, not necessarily be a recruiter, but really identifying extraordinary talent. And then helping them get the right customers and think about go to market properly and then helping them think about their fundraising journey and bringing in the right investors once they have product market fit or at seed and series a and beyond so when we narrow it down it just gives clarity to every investor we speak to they can see what sets us apart that's on the value add piece and then we, we when i say the final offering when we, we call ourselves the champion of the underdog that's what co2 stands for and ultimately, um, i was going to ask what it stands for okay champion yeah. of the underdog i like it yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> And and the and the philosophy there is that you know um, Jensen Swan from uh, Nvidia says this amazing thing. He goes, uh, he he says, "I wish upon you pain and suffering." To the Stanford graduates, I don't know if you saw that video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So the idea that what we what we try and look for because we're a first time founder ecosystem. So most people coming and building companies, it's not like we have a series of second third time founders as you do in more mature markets. So. What we tend to do is, as an approach, is we spend time getting to know the human side of this founder. That means looking at their childhood, looking at the decisions they made early on, what, what their aspirations are, who are their role models, where are they in the sibling hierarchy, and what are the most difficult uh, moments they've ever have experienced to date in their lives. And so we really believe that we try and seek out people who've had pain and suffering, essentially. And that's one of our uh, sort of philosophies when we look at human beings and, and, and sort of the founders we want to back. So... As this is all, this is all through iterative, the iterative process and sort of learnings, right? So when I say we define an offering, it's like you start off somewhere, you provide provide a high level pitch, but then you want to build depth and clarity around what you're doing, just like a typical founder would when they're talking to a, a potential investor. And so 
that iterative process happens with every LP meeting that you have. You start learning and hearing and, and, and uh, getting new, newer, deeper insights around what you're doing and, and sort of articulating it better through the conversations you have with investors. So um, I don't know if- I, I Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Uh, a couple more questions, I'll let you go. But you know, you, yeah. you just mentioned this kind of interesting, um, you're getting deep with these founders you're potentially investing in and looking for ones that, you know, kind of have pain and suffering. What's the pattern matching you're seeing of the successful founders? Uh, can you go into a little yeah. more detail on that? Yeah, what are you seeing? Well, everyone's different. Every human has his own journey or her own journey that they go through. But I think, you know, resilience is definitely for me the consistent uh, criteria. I think we look our, we, 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 you know, one of the insights we have is that, you know, Brian Chesky wasn't Brian Chesky from day zero. He grew into this phenomenal founder over time. So did Elon Musk, so did Peter Thiel, right? So it's like rate of it, rate of growth or their ability to grow as human beings, as leaders. Like we try and assess that through conversations and through, uh, you know, seeing how, how they're building their culture, how they're hiring and all these, all these like indicators. Um, I think, if I had to put other things, it would be coachability, at least taking feedback well, taking in, in, in feedback well and, and and delivering feedback well. I think they both go hand in hand. And then I think for us, it's 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 the other things we look for is um, someone who's able to, you know, um, basically articulate what they're doing with depth and clarity. That's ultimately one of the key signals that we look for. Because when you have depth, as I mentioned earlier, that means you've gone through this process so many times and you really have an intimate understanding of, of what you do. And then if you're able to communicate clearly, you can sell it to investors, sell it to sell it to future hires, sell it to uh, customers. And, and so those things are traits that we see consistently amongst the best founders that we back. Yeah, all good stuff. Okay, one or two more questions about actually raising the fund and I'll let you go. Um, you did the first close... I think you said it was about 24 million. So close to half of the fund is, yeah. was that intentional? Like we're going to get to half and then do our first close or is there any strategy around first close for emerging managers raising their first fund? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. I think for me, we didn't have a number in place. And to be clear, like I lost a $5 million commitment two weeks before I closed 24. Uh, so it could have been higher and it also could have been lower. I mean, uh, people could have pulled out, but I think for us, it was like 30% was the floor just if I had to put one when I was going through this process, that should be a minimum amount that would allow me to deliver on my strategy. Um, and so anything north of that, I think gave us just a strong enough cushion um, to to really build up on the future closes and the momentum on the fundraise. I think anything less than 30%, maybe 25% less than that would be a bit um, sort of difficult to build the momentum that you need um, to, to continue uh, deploying and raising at the same time. So, and to, just for anyone not familiar, define first close. That means, yeah. yeah, first close is the amount that you're able to get commitments for um, from investors, and then you trigger that when you do a first close. It sort of sets the the timing of your final close. Typically, you have a year to eighteen months, sometimes two years, to do uh, your final close from first close. Uh, and so, once you make a first close happen, you can start your fund is live. You can start deploying and calling capital and so your your goal should be once i do first close i need to ensure that i continue building out uh the fund size through future closes while uh deploying capital and showing sort of progress on my strategy and you're getting the money wired that 24 million you're getting wired you can start deploying it start doing yeah you can call capital we, we, we don't take it up front we, we do it over capital calls but yeah you can start taking taking capital out exactly yeah interesting maybe talk just for a moment you had an lp Excuse me. You had an LP drop out at the eleventh hour. What happened, and how did you recover? <laughs> yeah. yeah, look, it was that was one of those moments where I remember I was with friends out, and he um, gave me a call and told me he was out. I think ultimately what happened there was just we weren't able to align on. Uh, I think it, I think it was a learning for me where I couldn't give the investor enough clarity around. Uh, he was an anchor. He was a sort of a co-anchor. He was writing a five million dollar check. So. He wanted certain um, benefits, and initially I was sort of exploring it. But then my other anchor, also through conversation, was against it. So I couldn't give the the co-anchor enough clarity around it, and so I think that kind of didn't make him um, comfortable. And so uh, for me, the learning here is just to be very firm and clear with what the offering should be, and hopefully they either commit or not. But it was so close to the end that it just you know. Uh, it was a mental uh, a sort of adjustment for me. It was quite a painful uh, experience to have lost it. But, you know, uh, 
you know, you keep moving on. These things happen. If you don't have, if you don't have thick skin in this, in the, in the fundraising world, you're, you know, it's yeah. uh, these things will drag you down. But it was, it was okay in the end. I, I tell founders all the time, it's not quite the same, but founders who are raising, I'm like, how do you know when an investor says yes when their check clears or when their wire hits the bank account, right? Everything yeah. before that is, is a maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When you get to first close, you'll realize who whatever they committed in soft so soft circle to actually come through as 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 real commitments. It's true. Yeah. Awesome. Really good stuff. I have two pages of notes here. If you could rewind the clock, this is one of my favorite questions. If you rewind the clock and go back in time, what advice would you give your younger self? Or what other advice would you give to emerging managers that we haven't covered? Anything else? Oh man. <laughs> uh look i mean hmm, it's a hard one because if i look back and i say would i do this again after what i went through i'd say man that's a so difficult that i'd probably say no so i think naivety is a good thing and i think uh like rolling with the punches like because it'll only get better as you go like if you if you really have conviction around what you're doing you know, whether you end up raising, going after 50 million and you close 20 or you close 10 even, just get out the gate and go. Like if I didn't raise the $1 million sort of syndicate, which is not a lot of money. I mean, it's relatively not a lot of money, of course. Um, it, you know, I wouldn't have been able to catalyze the momentum I needed, you know, to go out and, and raise. I think having Huspy, for example, that asset in, in, in early on really allowed me to show the LPs, hey, look, I have something that's really doing really well. And not just my track record, here's an actual company. So that I think is important. So whatever you do, just start. Like if you're thinking I need to raise the first close of 20 million to get going, no, no, you just need to raise two or three, get some um, investments under your belt. Hopefully you'll find one or two that are working on your favor. If they start hopefully getting out the gate and showing good progress, use that as momentum to to uh, to catalyze a bigger raise and hopefully a, a actual first close. So that's a long, I don't know if there's much. Yeah, it's good. No, just start. I mean, that that is kind of the thing, right? That's sort of a truism for much of success in life. Just do it. <laughs> just get out there and go. Yeah. And, and it's not a big deal. It's not a big keep deal. Going. Don't make things. Yeah, exactly. Very good. All yeah. right. Um, anything else you want to, I guess, if people want to uh, get in touch with you, maybe any start founders in the main region, what's the best way to, to get in your door. Yeah, look, I'm on I'm on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is probably the best channel for me. Uh, they want to connect with me there and, and sh share things. And then from there, I typically uh, put it into our funnel and pipeline and, and just and take it from there. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, cold email? Do you take any deals over cold email or pretty much everyone has to get an intro through you or, or two? Yeah, look, I think I think what I realized early on is that, yeah, finding a way to get through. So there, we, we, we hunt a lot, uh, but... From an inbound perspective, it's always great to come through a trusted source. So whoever's in our network, that that, that whether it's a founder or um, uh, let's say someone that we have close ties with on LinkedIn or anywhere else, uh, finding a warm way to get to us is always preferred. Um, generally, cold inbound, it's it's depends if it's a very personal email. So I would say if you're new cold inbound, the best way to do it is to be very personal with your email. We get a lot of cold inbounds that are just sort of kind of copy copying yeah. you know mass email, and those just yeah, those don't don't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's absolutely right. Very good. All right. Co2.vc that 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 is CO2. Sorry, that is COTU.vc, champion of the underdog. I like that. Didn't know that. Um, this is great. Thanks so much. And maybe we'll catch you after you, your Nathan. your next giant fund. Uh, your two hundred million dollar <laughs> fund, which will be number two, right? <laughs> uh, we're we're gonna be out soon with fund two, but it's not gonna be two hundred. But I really appreciate you taking taking uh, like uh, you know having this conversation with you, and and thanks again. It's interesting, really cool stuff. My my Egyptian uh, employees are gonna love this. So. <laughs> I hope so. You should tell them we did invest in. We have four companies in Egypt, so I didn't mention that. But I mean, we we we're doing, Egypt's an intra exciting market. And I think you did the right thing getting them. I mean, I'm sure that you enjoy. The benefits of having a high produ highly productive, cost-efficient uh, team. Yeah, over there. I so, do. Yeah. They're they're fun. They're fun personalities. So, <laughs> and great English too, actually. So yeah. that's always good. All right, thank you very much, Mira. This is All great. Right, Appreciate it. Best of luck to nice you, to and uh, we'll you catch too, you later. Man. Bye.